Hi, I'm Gracie from P3. Um, I'm going to tell you how to build your FTC machine learning custom model. So the first step is to get an first dashboard account and you need to be on a team roster. And that means that if you're a student, you have to be added to the team before being able to use this machine learning software. So a coach has to go to this link here, the FTC scoring, and then they click on their teams, go to users, and then add role. You'll type in the student's email and select team member and add their user. So then once you've been added to a team roster, you click on this link, which will take you to the machine learning website. Oh, okay. And just as a note, students are unable to upload videos to this machine learning soft so software. So a coach will have to upload the videos for you. Right. Next as just a few tips for designing your TSE. Uh, it will work better with the machine learning algorithm if your team shipping element has con contrasting elements. So we, we have multiple colors. Uh, you could do stripes or patterns. We put some duct tape pandas on our TSE since we used to be the pink programming pandas. And also using a bright color will help since it'll contrast with the gray tile mats. And just as a reminder of the size constraints, they must be at a minimum of three by three by four inches and no bigger than four by four by eight inches. So then the next step is to take your videos. And for the best results, you'll want to record with the same camera in the same position. It will be during autonomous. So we unplugged our camera from the control hub and just plugged it into the laptop and took our video on the field. And you'll also want to record with the TSE in different positions by like turning it in different lighting conditions and with different backgrounds. Uh, and then also in all of the different combinations. So on the left or the right side of the field, on the red or the blue alliance, and in all three of the different square positions. And you'll also want to include shots that don't contain a TSE at all, because then the algorithm will not be searching for a TSE if there isn't one to identify. And this should be relatively obvious, but record your data on a field if possible. And then it's also easier to complete the next step if instead of taking a continuous video while moving the TSE, you take small snippets, less than a second of video, and then pause, move the TSE, and continue recording. So here is my team's TSE. So what we did is we started our video, we paused, and then we moved it around. We played a little bit, we resumed a little bit more. We moved it around, we moved it out of scene, and we kept doing this until we had what we felt was enough footage. And then you can see in this video that the TSC does this, which will make the next step a lot easier. Because this next step, uh, after you upload the video, of course, I'll upload the very short clip I just took here. There we go. It is uploaded so then you'll open this video it takes a second to finish processing there we go so you'll click on this video and then you'll draw your bounding box around the tse so you just click and draw it and then you'll give it a label and now this label must be kept exactly the same for each frame so you can copy and paste them if you think that'll be better. So you go to each video. And then since I don't think that since I don't want to, and I'm assuming you don't want to do this for what will in reality be probably closer to 500 frames, you can click on this button, start tracking. And after giving it a second to load, it'll go frame by frame and keep your box for you. Now, Sometimes it'll also catch the box if there's a major shift in the TSE, but other times it won't. We'll be coming up on one of those in a second. 
when that happens, you'll stop the video, uh, you're, sorry, you'll stop the tracking, and then you can click on this little delete button to get rid of the frames that are wrong. Oops. And continue drawing. So I'm going to purposely mislabel one of these to show you what will happen in the next step. And we'll say that this was all of the frames, so I'm done, and I'm going to go back to the main tab. So the next step here is to produce a data set. So you'll click on the videos. Uh, you might have multiple videos here, and you'll produce a data set. And then this percentage of frames for training and the percentage of frames for evaluation, you want this to, the recommended and default version of this should be 80% and 20%. And what this will do it is automatically separate out your videos into a training data set and an evaluation data set. And, this tra and the training will be used for actually adjusting the model. And then the evaluation will be how the model checks itself and sees how it's doing. And once again, the description is really just the name. So we're going to produce the data set. This takes a minute to load, so we'll skip ahead. All right, my frames are just about done processing. And now in my data set tab, you can see this showing up. And under labels, you can see that there are two, when in reality, I really want there to be one. But the, as you remember, I misspelled TSC, and this will really mess up with your model if you have some misspellings. So what you'll want to do is go back into your video and find where you mislabeled and something with a misspelling. So that was frame 17, or around 17 for me. Around. So here, here it is. I'm going to fix that, and I'll have to recreate the data set until there's only the labels that I want there to be. So then once you have your data set, you'll click on the you'll click on the data set or data sets that you want to use. There might be more more than one, and you'll click start training. And then there's a few different uh, things that you can change here. The starting model is the algorithm that it'll be using to train your model. It is recommended that you just stick with this default here. So we're going to do that. And then the number of training steps relates to the number of epics that are going to be completed. And an epic is a full cycle through the training data. Um, it explains it a little bit down here. But uh, for each step, the Images will be processed in a batch. 32 images with this model here um, will be in one batch. So that means that it'll take 43 steps to form one cycle through my training data, since in this case, you can see that I have um, 1,300 1, images in my training data. So this Training steps will have to vary for every data set you have, since it's recommended that you perform at least 100 epics full cycles through your data. So for this, I think that'll be around 4,400 training steps. There we go, 103 epics. And then that means that I might want to adjust my training time. And the maximum training time is the amount of minutes that you'll let this training cycle use up. Now, each team has a limited number of training minutes. I believe that the starting number is 240. I might be a little off on that. So you don't want to use all of your minutes up on the very first time you're training. One hour of training, 60 minutes, will cycle through roughly 3,000 training steps if you use this default model. So if you have a training time and you make it very high and your training steps don't take that long to complete, then what will happen is all of the leftover time will be returned back to you. On the other hand, if your training time is too short and it can't get through all of the steps, then 
the model will backtrack to the last saved checkpoint, which occurs every 100 steps. So if you have it train for 60 minutes and the model completes 382 steps, but then your time runs out, then the model will ignore those last 82 steps and it'll be the same as it was at 3,000 steps. All right. We're not going to actually train a model since I already have one and I don't want to use the time. So then once your model is complete, if you click on the if you click on it, you can see some graphs and these graphs can tell you how accurate your model is. Under training metrics, you can see that the learning rate, uh, which is how much the model will change step to step, originally starts off low and then increases as training continues and then starts to decrease about halfway through until at the end it's barely changing at all. And that's just how this model works. You can't really change that. And then there's a few different figures all that are loss. Uh, these are all really um, these are all numbers that you want to keep low. So a number closer to zero for any of these very values means that you have a good model. And then the evaluation metrics are going to be using that 20% of the data set that was set aside. And these include the detection box precision, which you want to be high, close to one for all of these precisions. This is related to the image size. So my image is large, which means that the medium and small are just going to stay negative one. So only one of these three will actually be a graph that you want to pay attention to. And then you can see that this model is pretty good. The losses are close to zero and the detection boxes are all close to one. So this is a good model. I'm going to use it. All right. So for how to use it, you're going to click on it and download your model. It shouldn't take too long. And then the next step is to program your model. And for this, I have two different videos, one that will use one that'll walk you through how to program your model using blocks programming, and one that'll walk you through how to program your model using on blocks Java. I do not have any Android Studio videos, but the user manual is pretty comprehensive. So you can look at that. The videos are going to be linked in the description. So see you in the next video.